Yes, welcome to our inaugural lecture for our lecture series on African philosophy, African contemporary philosophy. And the first speaker I will welcome today is Jonathan Chimakonam, who is a senior lecturer at the University of Calabar, and he's also a research associate at the University of Johannesburg in South Africa. His teaching is uh, in uh, his research interests cover the areas of African philosophy, logic, philosophy of mind, environmental ethics, postmodern and postcolonial thought, and he has published um, a, a tremendous amount of papers on a very wide variety of topics. Most interestingly for us, for us today is that he has developed a new conception of philosophy, the conversational philosophy, which also includes a new method of philosophy, which provides a new approach to philosophizing in African and intercultural philosophies, the conversational thinking, and he has produced a system of logic that grounds them both, the Esumezu logic. And this is at least partially also the topic that Jonathan will speak for, about uh, for us today. I uh, very warmly welcome my dear colleague, Jonathan, and I'm very happy that you're here today with us and we're all looking forward to your talk about the conversational philosophy in Nigeria. Welcome and the floor is yours. Um, thank you very much, Bjorn. Um, I'm happy to be here and to give this talk on conversational, um, well, school of philosophy, conversational philosophy. Apparently, I thought I was coming to give a talk on conversational school of philosophy as yes. a topic you gave to me indicated, but um, it appears you uh, want me to give a talk on conversational philosophy. There are two different things. Which one should I talk on? Uh, the conversational philosopher school of <laughs> philosophy. I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. okay, I had prepared to talk on the conversational school of philosophy, uh, but I can talk on conversational philosophy. <laughs> the first one is perfect. Um, however, I probably would have to start from the um, uh, historical backgrounds in conversational school of philosophy itself, because um, there cannot be conversational philosophy without a conversational school of philosophy. And um, so um, I'll start by saying that right about uh, the 1980s, well, there was this huge disillusionment that set in amongst debaters, those who were debating about the existence or otherwise of African philosophy. Um, uh, but, uh, in 1980, to be precise, when Kwasi Redo published his book, African Philosophy and, uh, uh, and Philosophy and an African Culture, there was something that he said uh, in that book. He urged African philosophers of that time who were debating that he told them that time had come for them to stop talking about African philosophy and start doing African philosophy. It was an epochal statement um, because that meant that uh, that underscored uh, the fact that uh, what most African practitioners of African philosophy were doing before that time uh, were really talking about African philosophy. Whereas what ought to be done was do, to do African philosophy, to build a system of African philosophy. And I would always um, say that a system of philosophy uh, has three main components. And normally this thing is not taught in any philosophical module. Uh, so um, it's not, uh, it's, it's not strange when most philosophers you know, find it difficult to understand this because it's not taught in basic philosophical mod modules. There are three basic components of a system. The, the, the first one is the foundation. At the foundation of a system, you have logic there, logic that deals with the laws, a guide, reasoning, and then you have ontology, that deals with realities involved in the reasoning processes itself. Um, on top of these foundation, you, you see the structure of a system 
which is um, uh, uh, which could be which are really methods. And methods are different ways of applying the laws of logic that lies at the foundation. And on top of the structure, you see the the doctrine itself serving like a roof of that house, you know, composed of concepts, principles, theories, and what have you. This, this gives us a fine uh, edifice of a system of thought uh, and, and philosophy to be specific. Now, of these three components, the foundation and the structure, the, they are key. Without them, the doctrine cannot hang in the air. The doctrine, the roof of a house needs the structure to support it and the structure needs the foundation as well. So without the structure and the foundation, you, you really can't talk about um, a system. And without a system, you can't talk about a philosophical tradition. And also we are talking about African philosophy assumed um, for those who are promoting it that such a system existed. All right, but if it, such a system existed, then there wouldn't have been any need to uh, undertake decades of debate because they would have straightforwardly pointed it out that it didn't exist. <clears throat> so they needed to deal with it. And we already were saying in 1980 that it was time to start building, start doing African philosophy. A couple of attempts were made, including by Redu himself, that came up with his conceptual decolonization. Well, brilliant idea. A couple of others veered into deconstructions and what have you. Interesting points, but they were not building the system. They weren't building the system. As a result, um, these offered sort of philosophical and um, historical necessity for the emergence of the Calabar School. Um, uh, philosophically, because the system was needed, and historically, because it was lacking. And uh, by the 1990s, some elements of the Calabar School, uh, notably Pantaleon Urebu, Innocent Asuzo, Chrissy Joma, Gautry Zumba, and so on, uh, began, had begun the attempt to build such a system on which to anchor the tradition of philosophy from Africa. And the importance of this uh, project, building this system, is key in ensuring that what is produced, uh, there will be no doubt whatsoever um, concerning the, the, the existence and the nature of that philosophical tradition. You will recall that <clears throat> uh, someone like uh, uh, Robert Benasconi in 1997 had uh, put across what he called what he called um, the double bind that goes this way that either African philosophy is so similar to Western philosophy that it makes no distinctive contribution and effectively disappears, or it is so different that his credentials to be genuine philosophy will always be in doubt. Okay, his double bind that was informed by people different from different places, those who challenge the existence of African philosophy, uh, and. Um, uh, who claim that what they encounter does not seem to be African philosophy in, in, as, as, as a discipline that represents a tradition in its own right. Rather, uh, in the words of John Hengelbrock and even uh, Heinz Kimmele, uh, these could be transliterations of Western philosophy or Westernized African philosophy. And Innocent also uh, describes that as copycat philosophy. So the charge uh, of copycat philosophy of transliteration uh, uh, continues to uh, loom large as far as the discipline of African philosophy is concerned. And they make, they make these charges make sense. Uh, the moment you cannot identify a system that you anchor the tradition on, uh, the practice of those Africans who were tutored, uh, who studied uh, in Europe or who were 
who studied Western philosophy, as well as their Western com uh, counterparts who come to the African philosophy uh, by bringing the structure of Western philosophy, the system of Western philosophy, imposing it on African philosophy, sprinkling in you know, some concepts from African linguistic resources, and then they, they call such African philosophy, uh, continues to plague the discipline, confuse the students, and mislead the newcomers in the discipline. Uh, because um, it is the system that gives shape to the tra philosophical tradition. And until you build that, it, it, everything you do will continue to raise quest one question or the other. And this is what um, the Calabar School uh, tried to do eminently uh, by constructing the system and anchoring the philosophical tradition of Africa they were building on that. Um, uh, it does not mean that that's the only one that can exist. You can have many, as many as possible, and they will become sub-traditions in African philosophy, just like you have the analytic, uh, continental, pragmatic, and all these um, uh, lines of um, uh, thought in Western philosophy. So we need more. Um, so uh, for uh, the members of Calabar School, those I've mentioned, and uh, those uh, that again succeeded them across the three generations that the school has existed, um, um, their, their style of philosophy um, share share a lot in common. And, 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 and that was why at a point I began personally the project of demonstrating the unity of their approach to African philosophy. And, um, and I called it conversational in style, but I'll show you why. Uh, for example, um, um, the philosophy approach of philosophy uh, promoted by, uh, that we continue to promote from Calabar School and our conversational school, these are used interchangeably because at a point, um, some persons when our work gained international recognition and people from other places wanted to be part of the movement. And uh, we had to, again, create another name to represent the intellect, international um, dimension of the school. And that was how conversational school came into being. So uh, it is, they are used interchangeably, Calabar School, Conversational School. So this school, uh, there are many people who have produced ideas and theories and concepts, but there is one problem that all of them uh, were attempting to solve and continue to attempt to address. And um, they, there are also, what, there's also one challenge for the school and two cardinal questions. Um, I'll talk about this and then I'll move on to conversational philosophy as briefly as possible. So for those who don't know, the Calabar School or Conversational School or what we stand for or how the school operates or what inspired the inquiries and investigations of the school, it's important you listen to this. The main problem that the Calabar School identified for the 21st century is the problem of the, is the problem of borderlines. All right, with the word borderline spelled um, as uh, written as two separate words, borderlines. So when this line is drawn uh, between races, it leads to the problem of racism. When it is drawn between sexes, it leads to sexism. When it is drawn um, within uh, people or groups with uh, different social and economic statuses, it leads to classism. When it is drawn among different religious faiths, between it leads to acridoism as, as so on and so forth. So the challenge, therefore, is how to trace, identify the root cause of this problem of borderlines and provide ideas uh, to address its various ramifications. That is a challenge of the um, philosophical uh, contribution from the Calabar School. And different actors from that school have attempted greater theories to address this, to uh, um, tackle this challenge and address the problem. 
Innocent Asus himself was able to trace the cause of this problem of borderlines to Aristotle's two-valued logic, uh, which um, bifurcates and polarizes reality into uh, to oppose the uh, units, uh, binary opposition, as the case may be. And uh, we believe that uh, one way to transcend, one that it is important to go beyond this idea of contradiction that is warranted in the thesis of bivalence and determinism uh, embedded in Aristotle, Aristotle's uh, two valid logic. And as a result, different um, members of the Calabas who came up with different theories, Pantoli and Urebu for one, uh, created this theory of metaphysics he called, um, he calls, um, um, uh, the uh, beam of metaphysics and, and, and all that with epistemological and ethical ramifications. And the other ontology is called Uwa ontology. And he, 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 he used the concept of being belonging to demonstrate how, um, uh, how to negotiate this binary uh, contradiction. All right, but before I go into that, the two main questions that these actors raised a lot of different questions to enable them uh, drive the theories they were propagating. But I can I sum up those two questions, those questions they raised in two. Namely, uh, does difference amount to inferiority? And number two, are opposites irreconcilable? Okay, so Pantoli and Ebu use the concept of being belonging to demonstrate that a difference does not amount to inferiority, it amounts to variety. And opposites are actually reconcilable. <clears throat> and this again was done by other people in Austin Tassos, use the concept of complementarity. Um, Godfrey Ozumba used integrativism, and um, Chrissy Joma used harmony. Um, Christy John, of course, created his uh, theory of logic called harmonious modernism and ethics and epistemology, uh, the one he called uh, humanistic epistemology. And um, Innocent Thousands created his theory of Hebrew and under philosophy with epistemological, metaphysical, uh, ethical, uh, logical, and methodolo methodological uh, dimensions. And um, um, it, Godfrey Ozumba created integrative humanism and uh, with ethical and epistemological angles to it. And then a couple of other people uh, to the second decade of the 21st century where people like um, Ada Gada, who would be speaking uh, after myself, created his consolation philosophy and used the concept of mood to demonstrate the possibility of, transcend, uh, of transcending this um, binary opposition. Um, uh, recently, Arabiato has created his theory of predeterministic historicity and used the concept of relationality. Uh, Madoka and uh, Finos, Mangena, Boni, and the rest of them use relationship. Personally, I have all, I've used complementarity, I've used integrativity, I've used um, relationality, I've used relationship. I all geared towards demonstrating that difference does not amount to inferiority. The amounts of variety and that opposites are reconcilable. Um, and, but it was um, Innocent Assos in his um, complementary logic and um, Chrissy Joma in his harmonious monism system of logic and myself, it is Mesa logic that provided a logical grounding for this um, train of thoughts that the Calabar School uh, promoted and continues to uh, 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 promote in this um, third decade of the 21st century. All right, so uh, with this said, um, one would ask, where does conversational philosophy factor in? If the group at some point um, started to be known as conversational school in addition, and um, if there are other scholars and thinkers in this school who have created one theory or the other, why uh, is the school known as conversational school in addition to Calabar School? It is because my primary project as a member, second generation member of this school was to demonstrate um, 
the things that connect all these theories together and show why uh, this approach to philosophizing uh, is a new one and um, the one that these people are promoting. And I needed to give it a name. And um, that was how the name of conversational philosophy came about. Um, not really conversational philosophy, eventually I developed as a theory, uh, but I described the approach to philosophizing as conversational. It's conversational, not in the sense of literal sense of two people holding exchanges as most people uh, assume that conversational philosophy is, but in a technical sense of creative struggle, all right? It is creative because it's progressive and it's a struggle because it's critical. And um, this uh, creative struggle, also known as aromaristics, uh, is uh, an approach to philosophy that is geared towards going beyond binary opposition to reach binary complementarity to demonstrate that opposites can be reconciled, should and can be reconciled. And, um, and um, I went ahead to uh, build on the logical templates that Asuzu and Ijoma had developed uh, to um, come up with a Zume's logic uh, that again contains three metaphysical principles um, and three um, laws that were not present in the logical tem uh, templates that Asuzu and Ijoma had developed, but, uh, but I built on what they developed. <clears throat> so these laws, the Njikoka law is actually uh, speaking about the possibility that opposites, uh, that, that the necessity of relationship between opposites, opposites necessarily relate. And um, the law of Mekoka talks about the context of such relationship. These relationships we talk about between opposites occur in contexts. And opposites themselves are like beings in context as well. And, and that the goal for the third law of anonymity is to transcend contradiction and reach complementarity. In other words, that this relationship between two opposites are geared towards complementation and not necessarily contradiction, all right? Contradiction is one possible uh, outcome of such a relationship, but the goal, the goal of such relationship according to us is to reach complementation. And uh, so these laws from the uh, explain how um, variables relate and enable us to, again, ground the methods that have been formulated in the, uh, in the school. Innocent also has its own complementary reflection uh, method. And, um, and I had defined this approach as, as a conversational from which much later, the conversational method was again teased out uh, accumulating various principles that describe how it's, it, um, it works. Okay, so um, with that in view, we'll, talk, we'll, we'll shift briefly as I watch the time to um, uh, the trust of conversational philosophy summarily. Conversational philosophy uh, is concerned with meaning making. Um, and we have to understand that uh, there are a lot of technical concepts involved here. So I probably would have to avoid uh, some of them and go straight to saying something that will directly make sense. Um, uh, the philosophy itself, the doctrine itself, a conversational philosophy. Uh, the method is conversational method. And um, at the foundation of it is music logic and, and all that. But the, 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 
the structure, so to speak, is nowadays uh, this called conversational thinking. So when the word conversational thinking is used, it refers to the structure, it also, uh, and specifically the method uh, involved. So let me talk about um, conversational philosophy as meaning making. It is not a philosophy that is in, it's not strictly interested in meaning. Okay, what does meaning, what, what something means, what is there meaning here? Do, no, that's not the interest of conversational philosophy. It's interested in meaning making. Okay, and uh, it conceives meaning making as uh, an is, uh, existential as well as epistemic activity. Okay, that is conducted through creative struggle. Whatever we do in our interactions, interactions, we are striving to make meaning. Um, and uh, existence itself, metaphysical, metaphysically speaking, is uh, meaning making. All right, uh, in the sense that uh, think of um, think of the world without anything except you as a person, and you want to uh, make meaning, create something. The act of creation is an act of meaning making. Okay, and how those the first things emerge, okay? And how do uh, subsequent things emerge subsequently from the first thing that emerged? Uh, conversational thinking conceives of this idea of um, uh, metaphysics of um, absence, okay? Um, um, if, we, if we say that this object, <clears throat> You know, there's nothing like this object, and we want to create it. We create it by meaning making, carving it out of the metaphysis of absence. What that means is that um, uh, at the at the primordial, primordial state, what exists is something we call open or metaphysis of absence. It's like a mold to me has no shape. It's reality, but it has no shape. So the creation of each reality from it is um, uh, uh, it follows the process of creative struggle that give that reality shape. Okay, think of clay. You want to make um, a statue, and you get a you get mold the clay, and you want to mold a statue out of it. In that clay, think of that clay as. is there, but each one you move that to give that one a shape and that, and that one becomes something that exists. You have created it out of the metaphysics of absence. The clay is there, but the pot, you can see it in that clay. You can see that statue in that clay, but it's there. Until you create it out, it does not exist. So when the act of creating it out is a great act of creative struggle. It's a struggle because it's critical. It's, it's, it's creative because it's, it's progressive. Um, it's, it's technical, it's really very difficult to uh, explain in simple language, but um, um, what I'd like to uh, say on top of this is that uh, coming back to the use of words and language, it's sort of meaning making that uh, everybody would uh, understand. When you be to uh, do whatever you want to do, communicate, teach, explain yourself, express yourself, you are making meaning. And this meaning making could be internal or external. In other words, when you are engaged with someone, at that level of communication. And the person speaks. The person is a significant, just as you are a significant. The words that a person is using are signifiers, but the words themselves convey ideas that are called signified. Okay? And 
but that they, they signify themselves, the words themselves don't carry any meaning. They are ideas. So if what I am saying now is I'm conveying ideas. I'm not conveying meaning. I cannot convey meaning. The meaning must be met within me and within you, the listener. When you hear the words I'm saying, you would have to take it inside of you, try to process the words and associate the ideas you receive. You don't receive the word, you see the ideas, you associate it with your own set of words. And you try to make meaning out of, uh, out of those words, your own meaning. And the process there internally is also creative struggle. Um, um, uh, if you succeed in appreciating what I have said, then you have approximated, then we have created what we have um, approximated um, transference of idea. But it will never be perfect, it will never be complete. What I convey, the meaning I have in mind cannot be exact same thing with the meaning that you, the receiver, uh, have in mind. What we can best hope for is approximated transference of idea. And uh, sometimes when that is not achieved, it leads to collapse in meaning, conversational set, set place, setting, crisis in meaning setting, and so on and so forth. And that again leads to all kinds of disagreements and quarrels and problems that people have in the society. And the problems that are created everywhere in the society from the complex ones like racism and, and sexism and classism to the everyday conflicts between people and between groups and, and what have you. There are all crises and problems created as a result of failure or um, uh, failure to create meaning, to mutualize our meaning. That is the concept we use for that. Um, uh, and, 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 and so on and so forth. Um, perhaps I'll stop there. I can see that I've taken um, uh, quite a lot of time and um, let's see how we can clarify some of these things during uh, Q&A. Thank you very much. Over to you, uh, Bjorn. Yes, thank you very much, Jonathan. I think that was a beautiful overview uh, and it shows the, the unbelievable richness of that theory because um, as I guess some of our guests will know, that is literally just um, a snapshot of all the things that are going on within the philosophy um, uh, of the conversational society. And uh, what especially was um, interesting and helpful for me was to um, learn a bit more about the history of uh, that school, because I don't, I have not seen it so far in writing. Um, so that was very instructive for me. But of course, I don't want to step into the way of uh, the discussion. So uh, dear guests, please feel free. If you have a question, feel free to um, use the raise hand feature. Um, or feel free to type it into the um, into the chat, and then I'm happy to take your questions. Um, just to kick it off with one question from my side, um, what I find particularly interesting, and what I find is is at least to, in in my perception one of the most important features of the conversational philosophy or of the conversational school of thought is the idea that binaries. Um, do not necessarily go together with contradiction or with um, the relation of contradiction, or to rephrase it in another way, that there are more options towards um, within a binary, um, within a situation where two things are being understood in a binary way. And especially this idea of complementarity is, is uh, it seems to me, is, is very important here. Um, in you have mentioned a couple of times the Aristotelian logic, which is certainly sort of the the origin, or that's that's where, in to a certain degree, uh, this idea of binarity originated. And Aristotle is, uh, Aristotle was certainly one of the philosophers who made good use of the idea of inferiority and subsequently of superiority. Um, what would you think is the thought that was taken um, more seriously within the school of thought of the philosophical 
um, uh, of the conversational philosophy that was ignored by Aristotle or by the Western traditions who had this strong tendency from their Greek beginnings until today to understand binary, binary, uh, 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 binarity more in a belligerent, in an aggressive, in a submissive, and in a, in a dominating way. How do you think, um, what, what do you think is, is this difference that um, this angle that the conversational philosophy found that was apparently ignored um, or where there was an interest not to see it or probably it was just a mistake within the Western tradition? Well, you muted, Jonathan. Okay. Um... Uh, thank you very much. Um, it was a mistake uh, in Western tradition. Uh, it's about it's, it's it's about what works better. What some people think work works better for them. Um, and uh, it's also important that I clarify that uh, binarity does not exist in Western thought alone. Yeah, it, it exists in African thought as well. Yeah. Um, in Lagos, uh, as, uh, and, in, and in Kinshasa and in Pretoria, if you throw down an orange, it will fall. All right. If you wish to cross the road, you will look left, left and right. That's binarity. Okay. Um, so, and people still obey the law of contradiction in these places in Africa. The uh, idea here that we are contributing is that um, um, it is not absolute, okay? It is not absolute, law of contradiction is not absolute. Of course, different philosophers from the West have even criticized it from Hegel to Ma Marx to uh, Connor to the rest of them. They've all criticized this law of thoughts that they are really not impeachable, as some people thought, okay? But however, they, they continue to guide reasoning everywhere in the world, in the West specifically, because um, nothing is expected to be perfect. The difference and what we are doing uh, is that uh, having surveyed the African thought system and different cultures in different places in Africa, we see certain things that continue to repeat themselves in such a good pattern um, in, in, in the, the thought systems of these cultures in Africa. And it is the idea that uh, opposites can be reconciled. It is the idea that um, we can go beyond this line of contradiction it is the idea that we can go beyond bivalence and determinism in our reasoning. Um, um, uh, very often in different places in Africa, you see two people who are uh, quarreling and then you went in to know what the problem was. And uh, by the time both of them narrate their own side of the, uh, the situation, and then you see the elder or someone saying, well, you are right and you are also not wrong. What does that mean? It means that there are both of them at some can meet themselves halfway because they all have a legitimate um, explanation to the situation that they are involved in. Okay, what does that mean? It means that the strict attribute of bivalence, that straight jacket, that absolute tincture that is accorded to it, that might be wrong after all. Okay, if it is extended or uh, if it is made to apply, uh, absolutely. Okay, there are situations where you can have exceptions and um, um, the drive towards reconciling opposites is to see if we can widen that space, broaden that horizon, you know, that geography where we can have more exceptions than not. Okay, and um, so that is, that is um, uh, what informed the, the challenge that the theories in the conversational school are attempting to address um, and, 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 and um, make their own contribution to philosophy. 
and, and as something again that is quite um, uh, central to the uh, philosophical thinking in Africa. We, we, we know that um, A and B could be opposite in such a way that they are diametrically opposed. We know that, we practice that in Africa, but we also know that going beyond, rather than focusing on that opposition, all right, and thinking about these two things as elements that can actually uh, uh, complement each other, uh, unravels and opens up completely new vista that uh, has a lot to contribute in the uh, relationships of um, human beings and so in the society. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Very nice. Let me read out a question by Paul Michael, and then we, I'm going to give it over to you, Zachary. Uh, so Paul Michael asks, what is the role, if any, uh, of other departments of philosophy in Nigeria, for instance, Ibadan, Ife, or Lagos, in the building of the foundation and or structure of contemporary African philosophy? Great. Um, um, uh, during the 60s and 70s and uh, 80s, the Department of, Philosophy, Department of Philosophy in Nigerian universities that wafted great intellectual energy uh, included some of these ones that he mentioned, the University of Ibadan, University of Ife, University of Nigeria, and Soka. And then uh, afterwards, you see other universities like University of Lagos, um, University of Podakov joining and all that. It was when they were in their decline in the 80s that University of Calabar, Panama Philosophy, uh, came in. The roles they played was in keeping alive the discussion, the talk about African philosophy. Okay, this department, the actors in these departments, as are actors everywhere who were talking and debating about African philosophy, were keeping alive that subject. They weren't doing African philosophy. They were talking about African philosophy uh, as, um, um, as uh, difficult as that might sound to hear, it's the truth. Uh, they were talking about African philosophy. And, and um, uh, they, they contributed, some of them eventually in the 80s and the 90s tried to produce some work, um, excavate some cultural worldviews and uh, come up, you can see Jay Olubi Sodipo and uh, the work that he did with Barry Hallen and a couple of other ones. Uh, that were, um, um, but the question is how much of these um, works are really, uh, how much of them, how much of these works would you really look at and say, okay, the, I can, I can, I, we can say that these works are anchored, um, a proper system of African uh, philosophical tradition in its own right, as I explained at the beginning of my talk. Okay, and there were also other scholars from those places who uh, not really uh, proposing or giving us new ideas, but raise questions. These people raise questions in their works uh, that challenged people to think deeper beyond what was common uh, at mm -hmm. that time. Mm -hmm. uh, some of them try to foresee um, the project that the conversational school, Calabar School eventually started doing. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, if you talk of the likes of um, uh, Godwin Shogolo and um, um, what's his name from University of Lagos, uh, um, uh, the late um, Momo uh, from University mm. of Lagos and, and all that, and, and quite a, a number of people, mm. these guys raised questions and uh, made contributions that uh, really indicated that we should be doing things differently. We should be yeah. doing things yeah. differently. Yeah. Yeah. And um, you can see that those were really important contributions as well. Yeah, because some of the elements of the Calabar School in their work should always reference them as uh, people who justify the sort of work that they are, yeah. they are doing in the Calabar School. So that is it. Thank you. Thank you. Um, over to you, Zachary. Hey, thank you again uh, for your talk. That I thought that was super interesting. I was just wanting to know a little bit more about uh, this notion of meaning and meaning making. Um, and I guess uh, just to clarify, not to impose any kind of material phenomenological distinction, 
uh, but does the notion of meaning making involve drawing of boundaries in and around both entities, I guess, out in the world, as well as like phenomena within inside of us? Is this kind of like a, a general thing or, or what? Can, can you just talk a little bit more about meaning making? Okay, so uh, two things. Um, if we go back to the old question of metaphysics uh, about where things came from, all right? Where do things can come from? Uh, well, uh, then um, conversational thinking tries to answer that by recourse to the idea of metaphysics of absence, um, in which um, uh, things that were in there uh, um, brought into existence by means of um, uh, meaning making them. Um, that involves uh, the relationship of the meaning maker and the object of meaning um, itself. Um, uh, if we want to talk about how we create things and ideas on a daily basis, then um, we use the uh, concepts of um, creative struggle that is involved in such encounters we make. And, um, uh, to demonstrate how we create meaning. Uh, the implication is that meaning itself will become uh, something relative to some extent, because it is something that you can, as an epistemic agent, create within you. Uh, like I said, the words I speak convey ideas to you. They don't convey any meanings to you. Whatever meaning you make out of the words I speak, you make them yourself, within yourself. And, um, and, and this is because, and this also implies that as many as we are here listening to me, each of us is making a different meaning, somewhat different from what others are making. No one here would make the same meaning from what I'm saying uh, as the other person, uh, as the next person. Um, and, and that is because meaning making could be subjective, all right? First, I'll have to associate, you have to associate the ideas I convey with the words you think, you know, uh, capture the ideas I convey. And then you distill the, your own meaning to create a struggle. And it happens very fast that you don't even notice it that it happens. Uh, but at the end of the day, the meaning you make of what I'm saying is different from the meaning the next person makes. But then, insofar as they are mutualized in the orbit of meaning, we call it orbit of meaning, insofar as they are mutualized, we understand ourselves. And, and we're okay with that. But when we don't mutualize our meaning, when uh, the uh, approximated transference of idea was not so successful, uh, that is when um, uh, we don't we can understand ourselves. Conflict will set in because uh, have so often you say something intending something else, and someone picks offense out of it, and then you are in a battle to explain to that person that that was not what I intended, but that was the meaning the person made out of it, um, and and the. Point here is that all manner of problems we have in the world result as a result of failure of meaning making. And it's always subjective. Uh, no matter how we clarify ourselves and make it as clear as possible, people will never understand us the way we in intend them to understand us. But again, we can communicate and move forward if, we mut if we're able to mutualize our meanings. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I think Amara, Esther, you had your hand up. Um, I'm not sure if you lowered it now intentionally again. So if you have a question, please feel free to, to um, um, Okay, adjust. thank you very much, um, Prof. I, you have actually hinted on what I wanted to ask, but um, let me still go ahead with it. Um, My question is this. I was actually thinking about this meaning making that if we do not transfer or pass meaning from one person to the other and what we pass 
uh, many ideas. Then I was thinking about, can't we have a clash of meaning where um, different uh, receivers would interpret these, the ideas, you know, pass in different ways that it actually conflicts not only with what the speaker um, has in mind, but even with other meanings that others might make out of the ideas that the speaker um, has passed across. And in this case, if there's something like clash of meanings, then how can we resolve um, it in such a situation? Thank you. Okay, uh, brilliant, thank you. Um, that is why we have problems in the world. Um, unless someone is sick, I, I do not know of anyone who would like to wake up in the morning and uh, take joy in causing problems everywhere he or she goes, unless that person is sick. We have problems in the world because of regular failures in meaning making processes. We fail every day at that. Um, it's become routine for many people. And when we identify those who uh, have made it a, a habit to uh, not to be able to neutralize meaning. We always say of them that they be careful how you uh, discuss with him or her, you know, if you don't want him or her to misunderstand you. Okay. But then the point is this, the, the fact that we, uh, that we have um, uh, uh, claim to the same uh, linguistic resources, and by linguistic here, I do not just mean language uh, as a verbal tool, I mean even gesticulation, symbols, signs, and what have you, that we have claim to this linguistic resource. And because we understand the logic at the foundation of that linguistic resource, and we understand the structure, the method of using those tools, uh, enables us to engage in meaning making, engage in relationships, okay? Um, but then that's not enough. Everyone must be able to um, uh, play his or her own role as an epistemic agent uh, for an act of meaning making to be successful, all right? When that is not done, a conflict, problems. And that is why we say that um, 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 the moment, once we remain in conversation, okay, um, uh, crisis is avoidable. We may have conflicts, but crisis will be avoidable once we remain in conversation, okay? Because the goal, is to constantly try through creative struggle. It's not going to be easy. Our daily relationship is not an easy one. It's a creative struggle. Even when you are with the love of your life, it's still a creative struggle. Because this individual is an epistemic agent that whose total body of meaning making uh, yields something different to that person than, he, than your own yields to you. These things make conflict inevitable from point to point. But once we remain in conversation crisis, which is a, a, a much more serious outcome is avoidable. When we talk of these international uh, bodies, the countries of the world, uh, conflict and war, we say, let's get down to the, get to the round table and talk and exchange ideas and resolve this. What are they trying to do? And sometimes they say talk has broken down They've returned to the trenches and they've restarted war. Why? Okay, because of failure to neutralize meaning. Um, not just in the linguistic sense, but in existential sense. And that is why meaning making is metaphysical, is epistemological, is ethical, and what have you. We must neutralize meaning before we can make progress and move forward. Otherwise, we'll break off. And that is why in the conversational curve, you have the motions, okay? You have the conjunctive motion and you have the disjunctive motion. 
all right? When we are uh, opposed variables, uh, are, are moving together, they are in conjunctive motion. Why? Because ontologically, it is a necessity by the principle of uh, relationality that opposites must, in, must uh, variables must relate, interrelate, because no variable is an ego solus. So they enter a conjunctive motion. But then there is a point where that conjunctive motion cannot go further. Okay, and that is the Benoke point because these are different epistemic agents with uh, different compositions. Once they try to force it beyond that Benoke point, crisis, crisis in meaning result because they are there at that point pretending or refusing to be reasonable in that encounter. Crisis in meaning making uh, occurs. And um, so uh, this is um the, the, some of the basics that can explain why these, these crises are inevitable and they will continue to reoccur uh, because we are all uh, epistemic agents uh, on in our on, on our own with our own peculiarities you can wish away the circumstances of our unique existence in meaning making you can wish it away um and all that. So, so those sooner that we had come together, uh, this junctive motion will kick in, we'll break apart again, we'll quarrel, we'll separate, we'll go our separate ways, we'll fight, only to come back again. Because necessarily, we must have to interrelate. Uh, and and, and um, if you take this to epistemology, we try to say that um, uh, um, uh, using the principle of um, context dependence of value uh, in ethics, we say that um, uh, value, okay, of whatever shade, is always contextual. Our epistemic claims are always contextual. There's always a context. This is the principle of contextuality, um, grounded in the law of Mekoka that I spoke about in his major logic. Okay, these contexts are what makes us. Uh, who we are uniquely, and we can wish it away, we can throw it away. And that is why we say that uh, context obsess facts. Context obsess facts. Okay, there was something that is true or is in this shape in this context, move it to another context, it takes another shape altogether. Something that is pleasing to you here, go somewhere else or be in another situation, it becomes displeasing to you. Context obsess facts. Um, and, and, and that factors epistem epistemology, ethics, metaphysics, and different conceptions of conversion of philosophy. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jonathan. Um, I've just noticed, Evaristus AU, you have a question as well. Maybe it's possible that we address that question after we have listened to Ada. We will have some time to um, talk together then. But now um, I would like to introduce our colleague Ada Agara. Thank you, Jonathan, so Thank far. Thank you very much. Um, Ada uh, has received his PhD from University of Nigeria in Suka. He has taught African philosophy and intercultural philosophy classes in uh, universities in Nigeria and Germany. He is recipient of quite a few research grants, for example, of the John Templeton uh, Foundation, Alexander von Humboldt Foundation and the Johannesburg Institute for Advanced Studies and the American Council of Learned Societies. He has, he has like Jonathan, uh, widely published um, and he has uh, written on African philosophy, metaphysics, philosophy of religion, intercultural philosophy, and especially to be mentioned is his uh, book, Existence and Constellation, Reinventing Ontology, Gnosis and Values in African Philosophy, which has been praised by African and Western philosophers for its originality. And it is one of the few books that, uh, luckily enough, was also indeed recognized by Western scholars. I'm not sure if it had, if it received the reputation it should have received, but um, we will certainly continue to make his philosophy 
more widely known. And this is another beautiful opportunity to do that today. As I said before, I'm going to share my screen now and I'm going to present, uh, and Ara is going to present via a pre recorded session to avoid, on the one hand, any technical difficulties that might occur and to otherwise um, avoid any problems that might result from um, Ara's hearing impairment. So, um, also to remind you, while that video runs or after that video, if you have any questions, please put them in the chat so that Ada might read them out and then he can answer them for us all. Okay, let me quickly start sharing my screen. And let us now welcome Ada Agada and his talk on consolationism. Hello, everyone. This is Dr. Ada Agada. I'll be speaking on the topic, the philosophy of conservationism. Good. Now I proceed with my talk. I'm start sharing my screen now. The objectives of this talk are as follows. To present conservationism as a 21st century African philosophical synthesis. I also unpack the idea of mode, which underguides conservationism. And at the same time, link it with the idea of God. My talk. We also explore the concept of a human being as homo melancholicus. Finally, I will conclude by responding to two basic questions of conservationism. Namely, is the universe pointless? And two, is human life meaningless? So we get, we get this in mind as I proceed with the talk. Conservation and conservationism. Conservationism is a term I coined to describe the philosophy of conservation. It is first century African philosophical synthesis that seeks to respond to the two basic questions of is the universe pointless and is human life meaningless? So the third conservation is a third category that captures the, the condition of a deities that exist in the, in the universe that we've described as tragic. The universe that strives, that gives evidence of striving, of yearning, even as the goal of this striving can never be attained. So conservation is a third category that captures that tragic condition of yearning and tightness that never reaches their goal, that never reaches their goal. Conservation is the, the philosophical architecture within which the concept of conservation is articulated. So why conservation captures a condition of entities in the UNA universe, conservationism is a metaphysical system, the intellectual architecture under which, within which the conservation is articulated. In this system of conservationism, the idea of mode is by water. Since everything in the universe is defined as either mode or the expression manifestation of mode. So let us now move to the next section. What is mode? It's a good question. <laughs> the idea of mode. My idea of mode evolves within the philosophic tradition called African philosophy. It follows from my quest for a fundamental principle, 
within which I can articulate comprehensive metaphysics that accounts for the reality of the universe and the condition of human beings. This search for a fundamental principle is not entirely a new one. The philosophers blessed tempers. Kwai Mijechi, Mogobe Ramose, and innocent ourselves in their different ways try to identify fundamental principles that we enable them to articulate a thorough going metaphysical system. In Tasset Tempus, we have the idea of the vital force, a principle that animates the universe, conceived by him as issuing from God and enlivening everything in the universe, animating everything. So God, human beings, lesser divinities, vegetable life, mineral existence, they all possess this vital force. However, tempest did not go far enough to give the idea of vital force a compelling philosophical formulation. In Jake, in Jake, you also find this. You also see the quest for a fundamental universal, fundamental animating principle, a thorough going principle that can account for the universe, that all the entities within it. Jake arrived at what he calls the Susun, a non material principle that animates everything in the universe. He also, like, Tempest conceive it as issuing from God. Ramos said, just like Jechi, arrives at what he calls being becoming as universal being, as that which manifests itself as incessant change, eternal becoming. As souls advances the thoughts of Tempest, Jechi Aramos in his attempt to arrive at a complementary metaphysics that account for the noted African complementary and complementaristic worldview. Whereas in ourselves, we fail to find a singular term to capture what this fundamental principle is. Yes, we can find the idea of missing links which seeks to define the account for the reality of being. According to ourselves, being is that on account of which whatever exists serves as a missing link of reality. So we can see that from that place to get to ourselves, they are seen an attempt to identify what being is. Why then the sticks being with vital first? And Jechi with Soso and Rama say it will be becoming or eternal becoming or change. A Soso is not directly forthcoming. It does not identify anything that we can call being. Rather, it tells us that being is that on account of which anything that exists serves a missing link of reality. So with ourselves, we find the question mark. It suggests that being is that which is incomplete. That whatever, whatever is universal, that being, which is indeed universal, is that which reveals itself as an incompleteness. Taking up the problem from where this color stopped, I write at the concept of mood as the fundamental principle in the conservationist universe. I realize that for mood to account for the for entities in the universe, to extend the universe in any satisfactory manner, it must be able to tell us account for the reality of physical as well as immaterial or non-physical phenomena. Hence, I defined articulated mode as 
the consciousness matter principle, the consciousness matter interface, the totality, the unity of the material and the non-material dimensions of the universe. It reveals itself as yearning. Its essence is yearning. Mood underlies all the types in the universe, be it God, human beings, deities, uh, inanimate things, everything is a spark and expression of mood. So mood is then a unity, a totality of the material and the non-material, what African philosophers like to call the spiritual. So here we have a precise definition of mood. Mood is the primordial mind matter interface, the source of all intelligence in the world, all the emotions in the universe. It is that where the borderless border, where borders distinguishing the phenomenon of mind from matter are constantly transgressed, so that it makes more sense for us to talk about phases of reality, that is, the material and immaterial phases of reality, rather than strictly mind and material realities. So when we see a rock, for instance, we, we can talk of this rock as a physical thing, but also as an entity with a non-physical dimension, which will now consist in its micro history, in the fact that it exists to be perceived by a mind and becomes a part of a totality, an expression totality, totality, which is revealed itself as at once material and immaterial. So mood is a primordial mind matter phenomenon, a principle that animates the universe, infects and affects everything in this universe. Nothing escapes mood. And since mood is defined by the essence of journey, it is always an incompleteness. So the incomplete being, which ourselves struggles to articulate, emerges as the incomplete mind matter phenomenon, phenomenon of the conservationist thinker. Okay, now that I've attempted to give an idea of what mood is mm -hmm. as a mind matter unity, a universal animating principle with a material and an immaterial dimension, which underlies everything, informs everything, and defines the universe as journey. Let us see how mood is related to God. The question of God, the theme of God, occupies a place of pride in the conservationist universe. So we are now moving on. In African philosophy, we can broadly identify two views of God, the transcendental and the limitation views. Proponents of the transcendental view hold that God is omnipotent, omniscient, and omnibenevolent. That is, is a perfect and necessary being. Why proponents of the limitation view hold that God, traditional African thought, conceives God as only a high deity, limited, put in power and knowledge, and not only this, but God is also limited in goodness. I suggest the conservationist idea of modes in this, in this literature with a bias for the limitation view. Since I have already conceived mode as a universal limiting principle, having the essence of incompleteness, 
since this is the case, the universe is incomplete and imperfect. If the universe is incomplete and imperfect, its creator or its architect or its designer must by that very reason, also be an imperfect being. Now, with God conceived as limited in power, knowledge, and goodness, we can see that it is mood that limits God. If mood limits God, then mood is the supreme being. Mood is rather the most universal and the basic reality. It is what we call being with a, with a capital B and God than being a supreme being, but with a small letter B. God is not the first cause. If by first cause we mean the creator ex nihilo, or a being that creates the universe out of nothing, mood is eternal. As all this existed, God creates the world out of materials supplied by mood. With mood posited as eternal, it limits, it automatically limits God. So we now see that God is also a creature of mood. He, do, he does not predate mood, but he is powerful and knowledge to the extent that we can describe it as a being who is able to manipulate the resources of mood and in the process create a universe at all. So why mood is a universal limiting principle that also limits God, it is not an entity. However, God is an entity, one that is limited by mood. Thus, the world that God creates out of the resources of mode is a dated world within the universe that is eternal and animated by the phenomenon, the principle of modes. Now, Having described, having articulated the relationship between mood and God, I will proceed with this, the next important pivotal thing in conservationist philosophy, which is the human being. But before that, I will emphasize that the universe of mood is a tragic universe. Because it is a universe of journey, one in an eternal process of becoming with a goal which human beings cannot discern, but which is which must endure all the same, since this universe reveals the character of striving. They cannot be striving journey without a purpose. Although we cannot identify exactly what this purpose is, it must exist. Forget to be in a becoming. However, there is no harm in speculating. Consolationist philosophy speculates that the goal of the universe is perfection, the attainment of perfection or completeness, the, elim the elimination of moral evil as well as physical evil. Yet, since the universe is Eternal becoming, continuous change, unending striving. This goal, according to the speculative system of conservationism, is unattainable. If the goal of perfection is unattainable in a striving universe, such a universe is a tragic universe. In such an imperfect universe, the one in which we find ourselves. Evils are real, but physical, what we call physical evils, harm that may be caused by factors beyond the control of human beings, as well as moral evil, which is harm caused by factors instigated by human beings. In such a universe, these evils are real. They are incurable, although perhaps through our human efforts, we can 
ameliorate these evils. So we then have a tragic universe, but not a pointless universe. A pointless universe would be one without a purpose. But our universe is, is thinking, trying to hear in a bus. It must then have a purpose. We may not know what this purpose is, but it's certainly out there. And since this universe cannot attain its self indicated purpose, it is a tragic universe. And all these that exist in such a universe are tragic beings. Now, I take the concept of Homo melancholicus. The term Homo melancholicus simply means the melancholy being. I use it specifically to describe the human being as a conscious being. We can, of course, extend it to all entities in the universe that are capable of feeling and thinking, or have the ability to feel and think just like human beings. So, the homo, homo melancholicus is the entirety that finds itself in the imperfect universe while it did not create, whose purpose the being does not know. Although such a being can speculate about the purpose of the universe as perfection, the term melancholy is used in a technical sense to describe the fact that. The homo melancholicus is a being fit for conservation and not perfection. This being is capable of evil. It is a victim as well as a perpetrator of evil. In a world in which its existence is dictated, it exists for a while, actualize some of its goals, and then it moves, lives, moves out of existence without reaching any knowledge of why indeed it exists, and the purpose of the universe in which it finds itself, the speculation about perfection being the goal of this universe. For the being of conservation, its condition is melancholy. And melancholy involves the capacity to balance the affects or emotion of joy and sadness for although the melancholy being is able to actualize joy in its mini creation processes, sadness is always its condition. It always falls back on the mood of sadness. Its joy mainly highlights the ever present meanness of sadness. So melancholy describes the balancing act of joy of the act of balancing joy and sadness of continuously seeking to maximize the emotion of joy while diminishing the emotion of sadness. A being condemned to such a balancing act is a melancholy being. Such a being, I can say, is a homo melancholicus. The human being is precisely such a being. Homo melancholicus. The meaning of life is a pursuit of the maximization of the emotional joy from moment to moment. And such a being is also a being of consolation. The meanings we create in our lives, which enhances, increases our joy, constitutes all that we have. They constitute our consolation. But then, why if you ask this question, if joy is real, does it mean that in my life at the universe are meaningful? We already see that the universe is a tragic expression of mood. Is this universe meaningful or pointless? And is human life also, which is situated in this universe, is it pointless or meaningless? We are saying that the universe is not pointless. What about the human being? Well, the answer is rather pessimistic. I'm afraid human life is ultimately meaningless. Why is this the case? Because pain and suffering, they follow homo melancholicus. 
from bed to bed. Indeed, we create more meanings from moment to moment in the maximization of the affect of joy. But for how long can we continue to create this meaning to increase our joy, to prolong our conservation? We can only do that perhaps not for not more than 100 years for most human beings. And for those who may be lucky or maybe unlucky for not more than 120 years. The more normal lifespan of human being will probably never stretch between if beyond 130 years. So the creation, the mini creation processes cannot last beyond 130 years. Eventually, homo melancholicus is condemned to death. But then he said, it is not the event of death. He said that it's a tragedy, the source of the meaninglessness. It is a fact that the life of homo melancholicus comes to an end without this being reaching certain knowledge about why it was born, why it had to exist, and why this universe in which it exists mm -hmm. in its turn has to exist. So we see that there is this, there is ultimately incoherence that marks the life of Homo melancholicus. One, he does not know why it was born, why it exists. Two, he does also not know why the universe exists beyond the speculation that the universe might exist to achieve perfection. One, which conservation is in tensors is impossible. So why there is meaning in life, meaning in the pursuit from moment to moment of the aspect of joy, ultimately human life is meaningless. Conservation is inadequate in the face of human ignorance of the purpose of life. And the ultimate, the final goal of the universe. But then this pessimism, we must take by this pessimism because why life? Why life about why there's life? There's also a practical interest in living. Suicide itself is good time. It is a cowardly result that does not in any way improve the human condition. So the interest in practical living compels us to at least overlook the meaninglessness, which encompasses us and the content with conservation for the sake of living. Now, so the universe is not pointless since it is in a state of eternal becoming. The coming is motivated by yearning, by striving. We just strive in pointing at the teleological concept of perfection. True, this perfection is impossible, but it is indicated. And even if we may be wrong, if I can be accused of speaking anthropomorphically, of, pro of projecting human hopes and interest into the objective universe, the fact that this universe is eternally becoming indicates that there is indeed a purpose toward which it strives. This purpose, of course, may not be perfection, but the purpose is there. Since there is such a purpose, the universe is not pointless. It is human life that is pointless, as I already submitted. Thank you for listening to my talk. And now proceed to take questions if you have questions to ask. All right, thank you very much. That was a beautiful overview of a very different approach to philosophy, or at least in my in my um uh, opinion, a very different um, approach to philosophy, even though we, of course, have a couple of premises that are shared. Um, I would like to hand it over to you, um, Ada. I'm going to quickly let him know. Then, if, you, if you would like to ask other questions, 
please write them here in uh, the chat. Um, we have a first question from Evaristus. Ara, if you wouldn't mind, please um, address this question. And I'm going to quickly take care of uh, some technical problems that happened here in the background. Um, let me quickly check with Ara. Hope he is still with us because we're experiencing some technical problems here. Should be with us in a second. my message now Bjorn, it appears the question uh, under the name Varistus is actually meant for me. Oh, okay. you're right. Wait, wait, wasn't there another? Oh, no. Okay, let me, but I, I'm still quite trying to reach out to Ada. I'm not sure if he is... I still have him here. Yes, please feel free to um, to address that question. I'm sorry, Jonathan. I quickly try to fix this problem here with Ara. Just one second. Okay, um, uh, but but for our viewers, uh, for those who are here as well, uh, Ada has um, slight hearing impairment, so uh, he may not be able to hear you if you use the microphones. That is why Bjorn is asking that you uh, write down your questions there in the chat, and Ada will respond. Okay, so briefly, while they sort out those things, uh, let me address the question here. Uh, appears to be a question from uh, Umezrike Zuhu. Um, it, it has to do with what I said about meaning making and that <clears throat> it is subjective and cannot uh, be you know, can, we cannot achieve a situation whereby two people okay. make precisely the same meaning out of uh, the same situation okay. or exchange. Let's work, guys. Oh, all right. Well, <laughs> I'm sorry. No, no, now he jumped in. Um, um, I, I will. I will quickly tell him that uh, that you quickly okay. finished the answer. <laughs> sorry, Jonathan. Okay. So, um, Ms. Rike is asking, what of a situation where a teacher scores a student 100%, does that not imply that both of them um, achieved precisely the same meaning from the exchange between them? Uh, I would not think so, it, even if we use the example of the mathematical science, the most precise of all sciences, and the student has followed the formula and um, made all the deductions and arrived at the expected answer. And as a result, is having 100% of all the marks uh, scorable. <clears throat> it does not mean that the teacher and the students share the same meaning uh, of the symbols and numbers laid out in the paper. Um, um, the student has merely organized the symbols and numbers in a pattern that is uh, um, expected. Uh, but what the student, uh, the meaning the student creates in his or her mind when, uh, when they look at the sum, they, when they look at the answer, when they go through the process of those deductions cannot be exactly the same as the one this teacher has in mind. It's impossible. 
uh, these people have two different minds that can structure reality and uh, exercise creative struggle differently. Uh, sometimes we think we see the same things, but we don't. We may see, we may perceive the same idea, but we don't make the same meaning out of them inside of our minds. What we make out of them are completely different. A student might see a particular formula, and to that student is just another symbol. The teacher might look at that formula in a much more different way. And there's no way they will know this since their focus is to see whether someone, a student had arranged the formula and the numbers in a particular way expected. Um, so meaning making is um, quite subjective. Um, and because existence is a subjective thing, we live our lives. The circumstances of our lives are quite different and unique from those of other people, and they all come together to influence how we make meaning uh, in our day-to-day -day relationships. Thank you very much. Over to you, Bjorn. It appears there are questions, so I don't know. I think I'm clear. I think I'm clear. Thank you, Prof. Thank you very much. Thank you, Prof. Um, all right, let me quickly text out of the go. All right. And he should be with us in a second. Okay. There this is. is this is Dr. Ada Agada. I thank you all for listening to my pre-recorded speech. I will now proceed to ask the questions already tied to the chat box allowed. I respond to them. Okay. Someone has asked, could you elaborate on the existential approach of your philosophy? I'm happy to do this. Well, consolationism can be regarded as an African existentialism to the extent that the human being as homo melancholicus takes a pivotal position. I was interested in understanding how the human being can navigate its way in a tragic universe. So this human being now is a homo melancholicus to the extent that a unique characteristic, a unique trait defines its essence and this is discontent because joy is not fully available to this being in the form of happiness, constant bliss. And this being is continuously assailed, menaced by sadness. So since this is a being that continuously, continuously seek the diminution of sadness from moment to moment, and the maximization of the emotion of joy, also from moment to moment, such a being is a homo melancholicus. So the idea of homo melancholicus marks conservationism as an existentialist philosophy. And you could perhaps juxtapose this idea with the ideas of Heidegger, Sartre, Marcel, Unamuno, and others in the Western tradition. Okay, let me now move to the second question. I would be interested in the status of your understanding of God and the implicit proof for the existence of God. Well, as I already noted in my pre-recorded talk, there are two views of God in African philosophy. One transcendental, which corresponds to traditional theism, the view that God is omnipotent, omniscient and omnibenevolent. My consolationist perspective locates God in the limited limitation view, which says that God is limited in power and knowledge because he is not a faced being, or rather he is limited by something that precedes him, which I have identified in this talk as mood. Talking about the formal proof for the existence of God, I did say this is beyond the scope of this particular talk, but I can give a suggestion. In a recent paper appearing soon in Religious Studies Journal, I argue for what I, 
I elaborated what I called the argument from life, a proof for the rationality of belief in God based on the argument from life. I argue it is, well, you can say a variant of the cosmological arguments from an African perspective. If life is a common future of the world, then we may argue to a higher being, the highest being in the universe, who maximally exemplifies life and creates living entities from resources available to this being in mood. I'm afraid this should be okay because it will complicate this talk since I did not discuss this in the, in the pre-recorded talk. Okay, let me move to other questions. Okay, someone is asking, I am one. Okay, I am wondering whether a transhumanist would agree with you that we cannot attain perfection here on earth. A transhumanist believe that we can attain perfection here on earth through the means of science and technology. My response is that science and technology is a creation of a human being and be the creation of the human being subject to the human intellect and the whims of our emotion. Such a creation can never lead to perfection. Human emotion comprehensively manipulates a, a science and technology. You might have ever been to a sophisticated football stadium where you see a science deployed to create atmosphere that magnifies or inflames our emotion with the action of the field, goes called ETC. You may also talk of it, the television, all the comfortable gadgets, the internet that have been created, they are only the service of emotion. What of nuclear weapons, nukes that have been produced to message the pride of nations, which now treat itself humanity. So what transhumanist uh, equipment or gadgets or facilities or whatever can be produced that can reach its perfection, since it must go to human emotion, it must go to that instinct, that is content that drives homo melancholicus. The very definition of a human being as homo melancholicus in a tragic universe automatically means that whatever triumph, science, and technology can achieve in this world will also be put to the service of evil. For this reason, I will not put my faith in science and technology. Okay, here is another question. What is the conciliationist view of suicide, taking into cognizance the meaninglessness of life in an imperfect universe. Well, suicide is also futile. It achieves nothing. It is a termination of human life, but the life that is the self termination of life does not bring us nearer to knowledge of why the universe exists and why human beings also have to exist in this universe. So it is cowardly and futile. It is a braver option for us to live out our days, seek consolation, be comforted with this, and then exit the stage of life in our ignorance. This is a better option. Okay, there is a question here. What consolation philosophy predispose one to Pollyanna syndrome, the tendency of being too optimistic about life. No, I don't think so, because we already recognize that we are in a tragic universe. In the search for consolation, we try to harmonize our personal interest with the interests of our fellow human beings. In this search, we are really aware of our limitations as well as uh, the limitations of our fellow human beings. We therefore strive not to be too optimistic, but to be rational and to be good. So I don't think it will create uh, too much optimism. This is a curious question because I've sometimes been accused of being an African pessimist.
Somebody is asking, you claim that mood is high and above God. Do you think that Africans would agree with you on this? The traditional Africans believe that God is highest, higher and above everything. If this is the case, don't you think your theory being African might be misleading? Well, there is no incompatibility. Why being, why mood is the fundamental reality in being with a capital B and what comes before anything else? It is not an entity. Since mood is not an entity, but simply a universal limiting principle, it is not in competition with God. God masters mood, and it is because he's able to master mood that he attains sufficient knowledge to create the world at all. So God remains the highest being, even in the constellationist system. But mood has a certain primacy to the extent that it, is, it comes before everything, but it can be manipulated. Even human beings can manipulate mood too. So my sister remains in agreement with the basic African worldview. Is there any question? Any further question? So someone is asking, but living is more futile and tortuous. If one is tired, why can't he or she take the bold step of exiting the stage of existence? Why cling on? Because suicide terminates life and reduces the number of consolations that are available that leads us to at least ask patients. It is also an act of self-violence. It avails nothing. Our weariness does not change anything. After we might have terminated our own life forcefully, the world continues and other lives continue for others. It is more, it is braver for a person to endure and live out his or her allotted lifetime that to take the cowardly way out of inflicting a self-violence that avails nothing. The problem is that it involves an act of violence that terminates possible other moments of meaning that may be available to this being e.g. in eating delicious meals, procreating, interaction with friends, and other moments of meaning, they are cut short in the most violent way by the option of suicide, which also avails nothing. Okay, there's yet another question. Dr. Agatha, this expository lecture series is it melancholic or joyful to your estimation? It is joyful. My lecture is an endorsement, an affirmation of the joy side of existence. Because we are indulging here, we are benefiting from what I call intellectual consolation. First of all, let me define consolation as an intellectual and emotional state of the mind that emerges from the, our realization that we are able to actualize joy to some extent, even in the midst of sadness. So consolation implicates both intellect and emotion. My talk today, therefore, is an affirmation of joy. Thank you all for listening. I will not terminate my talk. Thank you, John, and all of us participated in this lecture. You're muted, Bjorn. Oh boy. Thank you very much, Ara. Let me just quickly... Um, Thank Ada here in writing so that he knows. 
All right. Um, I've just posted something in case this is uh, this is a sensitive area. Some of you might not be affected by that. Some of you might be affected by that. There's no shame in that. Just please know that there are resources. Um, please feel free to reach out to these resources. Do not try to deal with that on your own. There is certainly something um, that there, there are resources that will be available to all of us. Thank you very, very much. That was a brilliant insight in contemporary Nigerian African thought. It was um, a great overview. It was a lively discussion. I thank you very much. I'm very sorry. Uh, this is why I was a bit distracted because apparently a couple of our dear African colleagues could not join. Um, we tried to fix that on the side. Um, if you have colleagues uh, who could not join, just tell them to, to uh, get in touch with me. I'll try to fix that. I think in most cases, the problem was that you have to log in with your Zoom account before you can join the meeting. Um, as far as I can see, that these were the problems. So, But it would be a shame if, you know, this is why I spread this information quickly. It would be a shame if we lose somebody uh, because of that silly technical problem. All right, Ara, thank you very much. Jonathan, thank you very much. This um, session has been recorded. It will take a little moment. You know, it has to go through university and everything before it will be made available, but it will be made available at one point. I hope to see you um, at the next lecture. At the moment, it is planned to have a lecture which will cover contemporary philosophy in Ghana. In case you would like to reach out, if you have questions, if you have advice for me, what to do better, if you have recommendations, or if you would like to speak yourself in this series, please feel free to contact me. Again, thank you very much for our very dear speakers. It was a beautiful event. In case you need anything, in case you have any questions, feel free to reach out. Um, let me quickly thank Ara again. Thank you very much. I hope you all have a great day. Jonathan, thank you very much. It was a beautiful event. I'm very happy that it went the way it did. Thank you thank very you. much. See you thank all. Thank you, soon. everyone. Goodbye. Enjoy the rest of your day. Uh, thank you. Thank Goodbye. you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Goodbye. Uh, thank you. Bye bye. Love you all.